Hello, everybody. It's Tuesday, April 12th, 2013. What did I say, April 12th? No, that's not right. It's, it's April 2nd. See, April Fool's Day has got me. It's Tuesday, April 2nd, 2013. I'm Marty Owings. Welcome to Capital Conversations. Tonight on the program, I'm uh, pleased to be joined by two guests, uh, Senator John Marty and Representative Dean Erdahl. Uh, Representative Erdahl is a Republican. Uh, John Marty is a Democrat. Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the revised uh, governor's budget and how the budget talks are going at this point, negotiations, et cetera, what's in those. We'll also be touching a little bit on same-sex marriage, and in addition to that, we'll be talking a little bit about the capital restoration efforts going on up here, and uh, maybe we'll touch on the arts and legacy stuff, maybe some other topics. Uh, I guess let's begin with you, uh, Representative Erdahl. Uh, the Republicans criticized uh, Governor Dayton's budget when it came out. He's uh, since changed, or uh, I guess he's collected some feedback and decided to some, drop some things of significant note in there, including a, uh, uh, a number of taxes. Uh, most significantly, I guess he dropped the business-to-business -business tax, uh, some sales tax revisions, and of course the uh, uh, property tax rebate. Uh, after looking at everything collectively that the governor has been able to do, what are your thoughts now with the, with the new budget? Well, I'm certainly, certainly glad that the governor made those revisions. I, I think the business to business tax uh, would have been you know, harmful to our business community in, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, mm -hmm. We still have concerns. Uh, what we have is a, a roughly, I think, a, a $627 million deficit right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, the governor needs, well, we all need to to solve that, obviously, but uh, the governor is proposing uh, 1.83 billion dollars in tax increases. Uh, I'm st we're still concerned about those increases, how they're going to impact uh, the business mm -hmm. businesses in Minnesota. Uh, he's got, uh, and the house is roughly 2.4 billion. They've got a fourth and fifth tier. Uh, the fifth is supposedly a temporary uh, surcharge tax, but you know we know that oftentimes temporary. Mm -hmm. at this place uh, goes for a long time. And uh, then we've got $2.7 billion in the governor's budget, I believe, in, in spending increases. Mm -hmm. And you know we're looking at it this way. We've got a, uh, a $627 million deficit that has been shrinking. I mean, it was $6.2 billion not that long ago. Mm -hmm. And we feel that we want to become a job opportunity grower and not a tax grower in this state. We don't want to be number one in taxes, we want to be number one in job growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, we're, we feel that some of these uh, proposals that are still out there uh, can be detrimental to that. Uh, looking at the fact that... Yeah, which over, ones in particular? Well, you know, uh, it, it's going to be hard to attract people to come here and live and work uh, with if, if we're up with California and Hawaii uh, among the, the very top tax states in the union. Mm -hmm. And that's where we would be. We'd be right in there with them. And you know, we need to do what we've been doing, which has been to uh, cut regulations, cut the permitting requirements that we've had, and also uh, mm -hmm. not increase taxes. Uh, we've. It, what, it's been working here lately. We have been improving. Our economy is growing at about 3% a year. Uh, we have, uh, if we do nothing, if we don't raise taxes, if we don't spend more, we've got another billion dollars just in natural growth coming in the next year. So I guess we're saying that we don't need to do some of these taxes and spending increases at this point. Are, uh, are Democrats spending the money faster than it's coming in, uh, Senator Marty? What well, I, I, think the, I think it's important we recognize often when you use numbers between biennia, it's hard to calculate, I mean, what the money's being used for and how. Um, I think the House is... Somebody better know. The House that. leadership has decided they want to pay back the school shift all in the next two years, and they're using a lot of the income tax revenue to do that. Whether that's the, whether we could pay it back over a slightly slower, slower period of time and so on, that might make sense. But the bottom line is um, the revenue they're collecting, I actually am glad the governor shifted some from his focus on his which taxes. I actually think the income tax is a fairer tax than some of these business-to-business -business and sales taxes. So um, 
I don't know, in the long run, how it all shapes out now, I think the, the House and Senate proposals are coming out soon, I'm sure, and then the governor's one. Um, I think it's appropriate that we have a more, a fairer tax system. And the other, the other point I'd make in terms of the job creation is, you know, I think laying off teachers as we've done in the last couple of years and cutting back on a lot of the investments in healthcare and so on, I think a lot of that, that took away jobs too. And we did that at the time of the recession and since that time. And I think the idea that maybe we create jobs, schools, not only do they create jobs for teachers and staff, but they also educate kids better, which make a better workforce, make it more attractive to employers. And in the end, you know, the, the idea that people flee certain states because of taxes, businesses flee them. Well, you know, we got more Fortune 500 companies per capita in this state than any other one. And our taxes have been above average, not, not that much above average. But they've been above average, but we still are far and away the job leader in the Midwest. We've been doing very well in that over the years. Recession, we were hit hard like everybody else. We're coming back. I want to make sure that we do it in a fair, responsible manner. And I think that the governor's budget puts out a lot of that. So I, I actually am pretty pleased with where he was coming from. Well, to, to that point, Representative Rudolph, the governor's called for a, two per, uh, a, a state a tax on the wealthiest 2% uh, of Minnesotans and also this uh, cigarette tax. And then uh, $640 million, as you mentioned, an increase for education. Uh, eight, $86.5 million for job creation and $120 million for local government aid, or LGA as it's sometimes called up here. Uh, where are you at, first of all, on the tax on the wealthiest uh, Minnesotans? Where do you sit on that? I don't want to uh, predict, but uh, well, I'm sure you have some thoughts. You know, well, you know, f first of all, you know, the calculation of who are the wealthiest is a little bit uh, uh, amorphous as well because 92% uh, of our small businesses use uh, their small business income when they pay their income taxes, their personal income taxes. Okay. So we are sure. affecting small businesses in Minnesota. And you know, I appreciate what, what Senator Marty was saying. There, there are some, some good things that the governor has proposed, but you know, we, we have to look at uh, not so much keeping businesses, uh, that is a concern, mm -hmm. but also who will come here. You know, who in the job market wants to move to Minnesota and why do they want to move here? And uh, that's why I think higher taxes are, are a problem. Well, let me ask you on that particular issue. You know, Senator Marty pointed out that, it, it, you know, if you want to say despite our higher taxes, Minnesota has managed to, you know, through the Minnesota miracle, if that's what you want to call it, which started in the 70s, has managed to build an infrastructure that are, seems attractive to corporations, at least for uh, intellectual labor. Um, what are your thoughts about the idea? Do you give that any credence? Do you think businesses are here because of that, or, uh, or, or are there other reasons that you, you, you think? Well, we have a lot of things to offer in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. We have good people. We have a great workforce. We have a good education system that we need to maintain. Yeah. Uh, sure, we have a cold winter, but you know that gets rid of the mosquitoes. I mean, there are good things about that. I'm too. glad you <laughs> mentioned those two things, because they were on the top of Tubby's list. From here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Let's but, see how that goes. But uh, you know, yeah. we, we do have all of these things to offer, yeah. and that is why we, in, in spite of some mm -hmm. of the things that you could call detrimental, like our snow and winters, yeah. we, we do have a lot of, of great people here. But my concern is that you, know, you, you kind of reach a tipping point. You know, at, at what point will they, when we raise taxes more, will mm -hmm. they just say, you know, that's enough. We, we can stay in, uh, you know, some other state and uh, not pay nearly the taxes and, you know, we'll sacrifice some of these things that Minnesota would offer. Yeah. Well, I, I'd say, I mean, back in 1999 and 2000 when the state cut income taxes, um, was you know, Ventura? We, it was under Ventura and Democratic Senate and the Republican House. I was one of the few, the only member of the Senate to vote against it because I thought it was an unfair and stupid decision that we've been paying for for the last 10 years. If we simply raise taxes back where they were, if we had tax rates that we had in 1998 and 99, if we had that kind of tax rate, we wouldn't be in the problem we're in. We have, since we cut those taxes, we've had our average household income has gone down 
because, I mean, inflation adjusted, we have not been surviving, thriving as a state. It did not bring in new jobs as it was promised to do. Um, to me, the thing that makes us the state, I think Representative Erdahl is right, we're a great state. We've got a hardworking, well-trained, well-educated workforce. Those are the things we ought to focus on, the things that are strongest for employers. It's a good place to live. It's a good place to hire workers. It's a good place to raise your family. And I think that's what our straight state strengths are. That's what I'd like to see us do. And, and I think the governor's investments are wisely moving yeah. us that way. Well, Senator Marty, why are the two mutually exclusive? Why can't we have that well-trained, well-educated uh, workforce and at the same time make our tax system attractive enough sure. to retain and bring new business to the sure. state? Well, a couple of points on that. Well, first yeah. of all, um, in order to fund the schools and have decent infrastructure, roads, bridges. But everybody agrees everything. the school systems are messed up now. I mean, uh, it, what across I'm saying the is board, public schools, right? It's I, I don't think they're all messed up. Okay. I mean, Dean's all a teacher. Right. He's a good teacher. There are lots of good teachers out there. There are good sure. schools. We have great success stories. Yeah. We have My son taught his children. Yes, his son is the athletic uh, director in my kids' <laughs> high school when they were they're way past high school now. But, um, but you know, the education yeah. system has a lot of successes. When you mm -hmm. look at the homeless kids who are jumping from six different schools in one school year, sure. you got to recognize that's not the fault of the schools. But the point is when we invest in our people, we have a successful, and that does cost money. And I'd argue having a fair tax code where those who make more, and I won't, I'm not going to argue somebody making 150 or 250 or whatever thousand a year is wealthy. I don't care what you call wealthy. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you call the one top one tenth of one percent or a million dollar a year in incomes and over wealthy. I'm just saying somebody who's making 250,000 a year could pay a little bit more if it makes our communities better, if it makes uh, safer communities, healthier communities, so on. So my whole point is, hey, we're not going to, what Dean or I or the House or Senate or the DFL or Republicans want, nobody's going to get everything they want. But I think in terms of finding a good balance, I think um, mm -hmm. since neither the House or Senate has put out budgets yet, I'd say the governor's one's a good starting point. I don't agree with everything in it but I think it's a decent starting point at least. Well, thanks for mentioning that. Let me ask you, can I pin you down on one or two Anything. things you don't agree with on in the governor's budget? Sure, well, that means you help me if you ask if you, <laughs> do I support this or I'm trying yeah. to remain. Elaborate, well, what about but the cigarette tax? I, I'm willing to do the cigarette, it's a regressive tax. It does hit low income people more. Yeah. However, you know, there are things if you want to reduce consumption of something, well, tax it more, you will have Now you're socially reduction. engineering. Uh, there are some reasons. I think that it is yeah. appropriate to, I think the health community will say overwhelmingly, when you look at the cost yeah. of smoking on the public, if we can reduce that thing, that's a huge savings well, to Well, so public. you support that one. What's I'm willing one, to do that. What's one you might not? Um, I actually wasn't a big fan of his business to business taxes. I'm not a big fan of some of the sales tax expansions and so on. So I was actually, as I said, pleased he dropped well, some Well, the property it. tax seemed pretty regressive his, as well, right? Well, his, in terms of his property tax yeah. relief package, again, they were all property tax cuts for yeah, that. Right. I think the 500 per household was not the best idea he's had. Yeah. Um, I think there's low-income renters and homeowners. I think the rent credit and the circuit breaker homestead refund those are important programs and they help vulnerable people i mean seniors who are living social security check to social yeah. security check those things help and i think he could have targeted much more fairly i think he's improved since the budget re revision he put out was much better well, what about the back and away from the uh what's the other uh i'm trying to uh remember the other tax here the uh, property tax uh what, what, what's the name of the property tax. Um, I, I'm sorry, it slipped my mind that I'm it, it's a t t uh, homeowner's credit, uh, homestead oh, credit tax. Well, why yeah. are we backing away from that That, that, that $500 per household. Yeah, exactly. One? I think there's, the question is, is that very well targeted? I mean, somebody who's, um, you know, if, if you're going to do it, let's target it based on the need. The property tax right. is not a fair tax. That's why people object to it so much. Okay. And I think we could make it fair. And local government can just raise $500 yeah, cover it. they can do that. So I mean, it's right, a question okay. about how. In other words, I would yeah. I would not focus as much on the. Right. I want to make sure we have fair property taxes, but just the across the board thing was. It wasn't the. Right. It wasn't my favorite part of the governor's budget. Let's put it that way. Well, because I don't want to run out of time, we got a bunch of topics sure. to cover. But let's uh, let's let's move on a little bit here and touch on uh, same-sex marriage has come up quite a bit. 
Um, I know, uh, Senator Marty, you've been on out front on okay. this. You're calling it the civil rights issue of our time. Uh, and uh, you've been, you know, leading the tip of the spear on this one. Where, uh, where's it going? I this think it's going to pass this year. Okay. I think I'll say that. I think I'll say that if it didn't pass this year, I think Supreme Court is likely, U.S. Supreme Court is likely to move it forward. I think um, 10 well, years ago, argument. most Democrats and most Republicans opposed it. I think now, vast majority of Democrats support it, and it's amazing. Rob Portman, Republican senator from Ohio, was strongly anti that has changed. I think attitudes are changing very fast. I think it's partly a generational thing. I think it's partly because people who we thought might be to roommates, we find out now they're partners, and people if people are attitudes are changing. I think it's going to pass this year. Representative Verdal, we uh, you know we hear this uh, Republicans and some Democrats switching gears on the topic of same-sex marriage. Is it a fundamental shift in their belief system, or do you think it's uh, more about elections? Because I think the Republicans, uh, the, the 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 electorate handed you a message last. Uh, during last election about this issue. What, what, are you, what are your thoughts? Well, first, I don't know of any Republican in the House that that would be voting for this, for the same-sex marriage. Now, there might be, okay. but I don't know of any. Well, you had one last session. He's, he's right. You know, left. But he's one moved to the Senate and is voting for it now. Right? Yeah, well, yeah. you know, <laughs> uh, and, you know, there is at least one Republican. And I think that Senator Peterson, uh, you know, it was a, a very uh, principled move in, in his mind uh, sure. to, to switch his position. And, uh, you know, there are other uh, former Republican legislators, uh, Representative Osterman, I know, uh, voted against, uh, well, she voted to, for the uh, Defense of Marriage Act when it was uh, 2003, I think, and now is opposing it. Uh, so there are mm -hmm. Republicans who are, who are switching, uh, but in terms of you know, the current uh, House of Representatives, I, I don't know of anyone. You think they'll survive in their district? Remember what happened to Paul Coring? We all remember Senator Coring was one of right. their colleagues. He, he was defeated after, perhaps because of that. I think attitudes are changing. I think I think five years from now, this isn't going to be an issue. Well, you know, in, in the election, uh, yeah. you know, the Constitutional Amendment just failed uh, in greater Minnesota and in uh, the vast majority of counties in Minnesota. Yeah. Uh, the vote was, was pretty solidly for the constitutional amendment, yeah. uh, but uh, I, and some folks uh, with its defeat then uh, read the reverse that now. Well, that's what I was wondering about your thoughts about that. Was yeah. it a stretch to go from the defeat of the amendment to suddenly? But really, Senator yeah, Marty, from, isn't from it really just it's illegal now? Isn't it just removing it right, from, from the? From my perspective, first of all, most of the yeah. people, not everyone, but ninety-five percent of the people who voted no, which was the clear majority, not majority of those voting on the issue, but clear majority overall. 95% were reading the signs that don't limit the freedom to marriage. And as one who doesn't think things, civil rights issues should be up to public opinion, I would argue regardless of public opinion, it's a matter of that. The conversation should do, we should be respectful of people who disagree. If the Catholic Church doesn't want to perform marriages, of same-sex couples, they should never be forced to do so, and they wouldn't be. And that's what I want to make it real clear. We respect each other's differences, but if, if my church, I'm a Lutheran, and my Lutheran church would like to perform such marriages, they should have the right to do so. I, my bottom line feeling is this sounds kind of Republican, but I think government should stay out of this. It shouldn't be government telling churches and individuals who they can and can't marry. Leave it up to people to make up their own decisions. And to me, I think Attitudes are changing. I think it's a fair prediction that Minnesota will have same-sex marriage perhaps this year, and I think that nationally it's not going to be an issue within five years. Any last well, comment on that? You know, you know, the senator may be right on that, but uh, in terms of, uh, of right now, I mean, my, my position is that uh, you know, marriage should still be between one man and one woman. That doesn't mean that we need to go out and discriminate against other people. Uh, I'm a Lutheran too, you know. I know. Yeah. Well, so. thank you for disparaging yes. my religion. <laughs> um, let's go. Uh, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about. Uh, so, so we're, same sex marriage is common. We talked about. What about this Mayo Clinic bill? You know, we, we, we what about the? So let's talk about this. You know, sure. you guys bailed Texas. out Ziggy Wilf and handed him a bunch of money, and the pull tab thing isn't working out. Now we're going to build some uh, stuff for the Mayo Clinic. I guess what are you going to pick your battles I make the same, I make the same yeah. argument that made on the stadium one, yeah. and that is taxpayers should not be 
funding mm -hmm. things for private sector I remember businesses. you saying we ought to be yeah, yeah. New I oppose the Wilf subsidy. That's a $72 for every ticket to every game for the next 30 years that taxpayers are subsidizing the tickets to the Vikings game. Gamblers are money. taxpayers. Gamblers are taxpayers too. <laughs> and they aren't clearly paying enough for it yet, which means other taxpayers are going to end up being on the hook. On the Mayo Clinic thing, hey, Mayo Clinic's a great private business, just like the Vikings are a great team, you know? Mm -hmm. I can like the Vikings and not think taxpayers should subsidize it. Yeah. I think Mayo Clinic is a great facility. They got some great expansion plans. I'm excited to hear that. But, um, you know, when I heard that we were, we're supposed to give a huge tax breaks to Rochester now for this, I thought about um, one of my colleagues sitting across the table from me at the time I heard about this was from Clara City, former House member. I Senator thought, Coonan. Yes, I thought, why, why aren't we giving big tax subsidies to Clara City or... or Cosmos. Yes, any of these <laughs> other communities. I thought that's not the role of the government to do that. I want to no. help Mayo Clinic thrive and survive. But we shouldn't be doing it with huge, huge taxpayer subsidies. To It's for the infrastructure, but that should be funded like infrastructure elsewhere. Is it TIF money, tax increment financing? It's, they're going to do something beyond that. They want to take income, tax, revenue, and so on, mm. and shift that all down there. And I thought, Rochester's a great city, and I want to make them thrive. I want Mayo Clinic to thrive. But what about all the other small towns in the state? What about... Well about Duluth, St. Cloud, everywhere else. Let's let's be fair to people. So I'm not a I'm not a big I'm not sold on this being the way to go. Good okay. point. I'm going to look at uh, yeah. I'm going to look at it more deeply yeah. uh, myself. One one of my concerns is, I believe it's thirty million dollars a year, and I don't remember how many, but it's a long ways into the future, mm -hmm. and that's a commitment of a sizable share of a bonding bill for each year. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, you you were are. You, are you chair of the HHS this year? Um, no, I'm chair of Environment and Energy. Environment. And putting on so energy I, bill. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that because I watched one of your hearings about the silica sand uh, yeah. mining, the stuff that's going on. And just before we get, I want to talk to you, Representative Ertl, about restoration and the legacy funding. But what what's going on there? What's the latest? What do people need to know about? Sure, the, it's, the, the, it's unresolved still. Right. The question is, this is a huge... Thing, small communities in southeastern Minnesota, some of the most beautiful bluff country there. Mm -hmm. um, tourism is a huge industry. Lanesboro and these other communities, beautiful trout streams there. Taking huge amounts of sand out of the ground, I think, is a, a thing that could be done responsibly. I think let's make sure we're doing it in a way that protects the groundwater, that protects the environment, mm -hmm. that protects the health of the people living next door to these things. Um, and make sure it's not something where they just step in like they did in Wisconsin. Well, they're having a little buyer's remorse over there in Wisconsin. I think there are a lot of people in Wisconsin who are upset about it. And my argument is let's help these local communities make wise decisions, mm -hmm. give them the information, the support they need from the state. I don't know that there's going to be a moratorium for a year while we study the issue, but frankly, that sand is not going to be less valuable a year from now. Wisconsin, the property, they, what they were paying the farmers for their sand tripled in a year's period mm -hmm. of time. Seems to me if we study it and do it right, you know, that sand is still going to be there. It could be tapped in a responsible manner later. Is an election going to decide this issue, Representative Erdahl, or can you guys manage to get through this up here, this silica sand mining thing? Is it, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. certainly an issue that people all across the state care about. Yeah. I mean, our aquifers, our groundwater, this is a a very yeah. important issue to the people in Minnesota, but it's also localized. Yeah. You know, mostly here it's it's the southeastern part of the state. Well, and you're hearing from business too, which which thinks this will generate jobs, right. and even some people in those communities that are interested. So in it's, jobs it's, it's the classic yeah. uh, weighing of the scale between sure. the environment and uh, economic uh, yeah. improvements. Uh, lastly, uh, I wanted to get to you about uh, capital restoration, something that you two both. Uh, I think are interested in because you have to walk, work in this building every day, but this is also the public's space. So tell me right. about those efforts. What's going on with that? Well, of course, this is the public's building. This is the most important, the most beautiful building in the state of Minnesota. And uh, it's 108 years old, and it's showing its age. Yeah, Cass Gilbert wouldn't like to take a walk around here and see what's become of this. No, uh, uh, we uh, began last year a program to restore the capital. Mm -hmm. And we had to start with the cracks and, and the flaking uh, of the building itself. And, and so we yeah. put $44 million in last year 
to start repairing this Would building. Would that buy you that forty-four million? Uh, mostly exterior work. Yeah, because some of those cracks that are open up in the marble work, if you get moisture in behind them, I understand that. Well, they had chunks like this big falling off. Well, yeah, yeah, and I, yeah. I held one uh, in a, when I gave my my talk on this on the house floor. I held mm -hmm. it uh, next to uh, about like this, uh, and the member next to me, uh, <laughs> Representative um, Matzel, uh, he was uh, a bit a bit uh, yeah, apprehensive. Yeah. But no, this well. year we're need, we're looking at 109 million dollars that we need in the bonding bill this year. To continue the restoration, 95 million next year. It seems a little, uh, it seems a little odd that you guys, uh, you guys, you two, guys are handing all this money over to Ziggy and your building's falling apart. I, editorializing <laughs> right now. Um, we're not supposed to do that, but from uh, from time to time, I walk into this building and wonder, you know, it, it's a beautiful place. Right. It needs to be kept and preserved for the people of Minnesota first and foremost, I would think. But when, when people saw these big chunks of stone that falling, I think they got the, the idea. Thing. I think yeah. Representative Verdo has been able to point out, you know, we've got to do something or the building is literally crumbling. Yeah. Well, I tease. I know you two guys, are, well, I, I, I know for sure you, John Marty, were against any of that. I don't know where you stood on it, Representative Verdo. On which? Uh, the this Viking oh, Stadium the Viking. funding and <laughs> You know, in lieu of the repairs that need to be done around here and the bridges that need to be supported. Just keep repairs. teasing, John. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you this, Representative Verdal. Legacy stuff has come up. It's always a concern among citizens that some of the money for arts and the environment is going to be diverted or directed at other things. As a steward, and you, you sat on the committee last year that... Uh, I'm the Republican. I chaired the committee. You chaired the committee. You and now I'm the Republican lead on the you're committee. You're the lead. So tell, tell folks out there what they need to know about, uh, is the money safe? Where's it going and what's it going to do for them? Well, we're very concerned that it be spent the way it's supposed to be spent. You know, the, the issue of supplanting and supplementing comes up frequently in our committee deliberations. Okay. And we have, uh, well, my committee last year instituted a lot Oops. of... Uh, Yes. Uh, transparency, accountability standards that mm -hmm. are, are still in effect. And it, it's important that we do this and do it right. The people... What's uh, the transparency that people could identify with? Well, we created a website that okay. uh, they can access. Uh, they can, so they can, can they see where they the money's gone? The money. They should be able to yeah. follow okay. the money. That's our goal. What's but the website? I don't have it on the top of my but head. But can right. you get it? at it from the state. Yes. Cliff Dahlberg, can you find the uh, website for the uh, and, and let folks know? Okay. Uh, so quickly, the money's safe. We're adding more transparency. You know, What's it being spent on? Well, we get about uh, $300 million a year. Okay. And 33% uh, of it has to go for ha habitat, 33% for clean water, 19.25% uh, for arts, history, culture, and 14.25 percent for uh, parks and trails, and uh, you know we, we try to get it in those categories. We try to do it right. Uh, there's always the uh, little uh, debate about is this the right project? Should yeah. we be doing this one, or yeah. should we? Is right. this is this the art we should do, or should we do this art? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Uh, but people need to know that in 2008 a constitutional amendment was passed by the people of Minnesota in which they said you can tax me more so that we can put the money into these four dedicated funds yeah, they and, uh, that, yeah. and so there are those out there who think none of that money should go to art that's a waste of money but there are some people who voted for this because the arts were there that's right yeah. and and so that's the dichotomy that we face mm -hmm. And this is not, I, I thought it would have been easy when I chaired this committee okay. to appropriate, you know, give back to the people $600 million of yeah. their money. Right. It was the most difficult thing I've done in my legislative career. Yeah, right. And, you, and you're no uh, newcomer up here either, right? No, I haven't been here as long as this guy, but yeah, I don't know. Well, around. not many people have. <laughs> they, they, I see some statues around here that look as well. No, I'm just teasing. John I just look old. Um, <laughs> Cliff Dahlberg, any questions from the Twitter sphere or Facebook for the representatives and, and our representative senator here tonight? Yeah, we actually got one through the live stream. And the, the question is about uh, green energy and why isn't Minnesota going even more green than it already Why is? are we not going more green? Well, we are working on that. I'm, I passed an omnibus energy bill out of committee that would be one, doing a couple of things short term, trying to start out with get the solar industry in Minnesota, like the wind industry, get it moving 20, 30, 40 years from now for a variety of reasons, economic, environmental, climate, health reasons. Um, 
we're not going to be using coal and nuclear and stuff as our base load power supply. We're going to be using wind and solar and so on. So I want to do, one, get the solar industry started, and our bill would do that. And then number two, bring together the Legislative Energy Commission, bipartisan group, have them bring together the industry, advocates, everybody, utilities, bring them together and figure out how we can make a strategy so we can be the first state in the country to be moving away from fossil fuels and totally to renewable energy. And that may be a three-decade project. But you we have to do it. Solar 40% by what year? Do you, do you we, we're, we're, we're talking 40% for renewables by 2030 and 10% um, solar. That's what the advocates were asking for this year. It's not, we're not locking in that. We're talking about bringing everybody together and figuring out, do a study to figure out, is that the appropriate numbers? How fast can we move? Yeah, because the Europeans are taking us to task it's, on this. It's right also there. creating Minnesota jobs. We export <laughs> yeah, that, 13 billion a year to other yeah. states and countries to import fuel. Yeah. Spending the same amount of money in the state creating Minnesota jobs is huge. Forget oh, not good. the environmental concern, just the yeah. jobs concern is huge. We covered a lot of ground. Marty, yes. I that yeah. Um, I'm actually referring directly to the capital. Why? Why isn't the capital going? For? Not, I'm trying to <laughs> not enough roof space and other space here. I think I think the goal should be other public buildings. We're trying to take other yeah. public buildings and require them to do much more aggressive green energy things. And though I do think there's a huge thing to do with energy efficiency in the building, making sure lights go off when nobody's in the room. There's a lot of work that to right. be done, and I think exactly. you guys are probably talking about that in the uh, renovation stuff. I think. No, the senator's right. You know, there are a lot of things that we can do. You know, within the building itself, and mm -hmm. part of the of the renovation has to do with with yeah. making this building more energy efficient. Uh, again, we've got 1905 uh, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure, yeah. and, <laughs> and we can do a lot with that. Uh, but in terms of actually putting solar or some of these other things on, we have to maintain mm -hmm. the uh, historical architectural integrity of this building. That's right. Yeah. And uh, you know, covering the dome with solar panels just wouldn't quite work. It gets a lot of use. We know that. <laughs> Well, gentlemen, it's been uh, very informative. We covered a lot of ground. We touched uh, on a lot of areas tonight, including the Lutherans, which we always appreciate. Uh, uh, <laughs> thanks a lot for being on the program. I appreciate both of you coming come well, by. Thank you. Down. Thank you. Good to be here. You bet. We'll be right back with Dan Fight from Occupy Minnesota, and we'll talk about what's going on in that area. Be right back after this short break.